Welcome to our live webcast, Continuous Regional Anesthesia in Spine Surgery, Experiences from an Orthopedic Surgeon and Anesthesiologist. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ryan and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A polling window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a sim smaller text box at the top where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our moderator, Samantha Strain, Product Manager. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Samantha, for opening remarks. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We have a great presentation for you all today and are excited to hear from both Drs. Deepak Reddy and Brian Schmutzler. I would like to take a couple minutes to introduce both before I turn it over to them. Dr. Reddy grew up in Chicago where he went to school through high school. He graduated with high honors at the University of Michigan and returned to University of Chicago for his medical school and residency in orthopedic surgery. After this, he went on to finish the storied Leatherman Spine Fellowship in Louisville, Kentucky. He now lives in South Bend, Indiana near Notre Dame and is in private practice focused on adult degenerative spinal pathologies. His interests include minimally invasive spine surgery, enhanced recovery after spine surgery, robotic spine surgery, 3D printing, and emerging technologies in spine. Now for Dr. Schmutzler. Dr. Schmutzler has a diverse background, training in anesthesiology, neuropharmacology, and acupuncture. Dr. Schmutzler received his medical degree and PhD from Indiana University School of Medicine. He completed an internship at St. Vincent Hospital and Health System in Indianapolis and anesthesia residency at Indiana, for Indiana University School of Medicine with a special emphasis on regional anesthesia and ambulatory anesthesia. Dr. Schmutzler is the chief anesthesiologist at River Point Surgery Center in Elkhart, Indiana, and owner operator of Clinical Colleagues of Indiana, Anesthesia Consulting and Clinical Specialist, and New Amsterdam Anesthesia. Currently, Dr. Schmutzler actively practices anesthesiology and acupuncture in Indiana and Michigan. This evening, Drs. Reddy and Schmutzler will discuss regional continuous anesthesia and spine surgery. Thank you all for your engagement and participation. Please help me in welcoming Drs. Reddy and Schmutzler. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and start off the presentation. My name is Brian Schmutzler, as she said. I'm an anesthesiologist. When I give talks about uh, regional anesthesia, oh, I'm sorry, disclosures first. Um, we're obviously both here on behalf of, of Avanos Medical speaking about uh, the OnQ product and continuous regional anesthesia. Uh, when, I, when I give talks on regional anesthesia, I always like to start uh, talking a little bit about the opioid crisis and postoperative pain. Um, I think it's pretty obvious now, uh, based on what's happened around the country and around the world, that we have an opioid epidemic and a problem with patients and people taking uh, significant amounts of opioids becoming addicted to opioids and then the societal issues that come with that. As you can see on this slide, dependency on opioids can begin very quickly. A one-day opioid prescription poses a 6% risk of long-term use and abuse, and as many as 20% of patients become routine opioid users after a 10-day prescription of an opioid. I, uh, I used to show this slide and think it was pretty cool back when uh, Jerome Adams was the uh, attorney general or the uh, surgeon general, um, although now he's, he's not the surgeon general anymore. But uh, Dr. Adams actually taught me how to do regional anesthesia at the county hospital in Indianapolis. So I don't just show this slide to show him, though. Um, I, he did have a pet project when he was surgeon general, uh, and that project was reduction of, of opioid use and abuse in the opioid epidemic. He said four to five people with substance use disorders say they started with the prescription opioid. And healthcare professionals should promote evidence-based non-opioid treatments for pain. So that's where I feel we come in as anesthesiologists uh, and particularly for some of these more painful surgeries such as spine surgery. Just very quickly, Azra talked a little bit about the added benefit 
of regional anesthesia given the opioid epidemic as well. So the, re the need for regional anesthesia in spine surgery. We, we talk about uh, spine surgical patients. They, spine surgery can be highly painful and uh, typically has typically used a significant number of opioids for post-operative pain control. There's been a long need for better pain management for spine procedures. And so in our practice, we've started to use several blocks for these spine procedures. I'll start initially talking about the erector spinae plane block, which is a bit of a newer block that we've been doing for oh, probably two or three years now. Uh, we'll talk about the superficial cervical plexus block and the catheters that we place for that, as well as TAP blocks, which I think most of you are familiar with, but maybe not for spine surgery. Brian, can I chime in on that slide for a sec? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I do 100% spine surgery. And, you know, orthopedic surgery in general can be pretty painful. When we do fractures and we do, you know, knee replacements and we do fusions, they're really painful procedures, and we drive a lot of the opioid usage in America. Um, spine has traditionally been a little bit of a black box because there's never been a great regional option for spine until sort of the last 10 years. And I think, you know, a lot of orthopedic surgeons are very used to using regional anesthesia for shoulders and knees um, and lower extremity procedures, but it's, it's really taken some time to craft pathways and tools to utilize regional anesthesia for spine. And I think one of the things that we'd like to convey to you today is that we think we've, we've figured out uh, some really good tools for you to use regional anesthesia to help your spine patients and lower the amount of opioids that patients are using to get them out of the hospital faster so they have less post-operative complications and that long-term, so that less risk of opioid-related complications such as substance abuse or just community-related complications of these opioids being out in the community. Absolutely. Very good point. Um, I quickly show this slide from the Journal of Pain in 2010. It's a bit outdated, um, but you can see that erector spinae plane catheters in our practice have essentially replaced all of the other blocks that we do for the majority of these procedures. I just like to highlight, you know, we, we at, at our centers and at our hospitals do all of these different procedures, but I'd like to highlight down towards the bottom, you can see previous to the use of erector spinae plane catheters for posterior and even anterior fusions and larger spine surgeries, we essentially had no regional anesthetic that we could use for spinal fusions. And now using the ESP catheters, we're able to, and actually this, the superficial cervical plexus catheters for, for anterior cervicals, uh, as well as tap catheters for some of our anterior lumbars, we've been able to really give a regional anesthetic option for spine surgery. So I'll briefly walk through the anatomy of the rectus spinae plane, kind of how to do the block itself for the anesthesiologists out there, and then I'll let Dr. Reddy take it um, and, and go through some of the anatomy um, from, from the spinal surgery point of view and, and how everything kind of comes together. So um, just the pertinent neural anatomy. So the goal of doing an erector spinae plane catheter is to block the ventral and dorsal rami, very likely the dorsal root ganglia, and then probably based on recent studies, uh, the ipsilateral epidural side when you place these catheters. I do like to talk a little bit about the sonoanatomy when I talk about an erector spinae plane catheter. I think almost every uh, anesthesia provider is familiar with tap blocks. And so you kind of see your three layers of muscles on the, on the ultrasound in a tap block. Well, in an erector spinae plane catheter placement, you'll also see those three layers. Um, they're different muscles, obviously, than, than in, in a tap block. And also, instead of going between the second and third layer, that internal oblique and the erector spine, or in the, uh, and the transverse abdominis muscle, in an erector spinae block, you're going underneath the erector spinae muscle and above the transverse process, which is the, the bone that you're going to hit as you go in. The muscle layers change a little bit as you go from high or mid thoracic down to low thoracic and then into lumbar. And so that makes a little bit of difference in how the striations look and how thick each of the muscles are. Up in the high and mid thoracic spine, you've got the trapezius, the rhomboid, and the erector spinae. If you go in between the transverse processes, you'll end up in the intercostal muscles, so we want to stay away from that. As you go down into the lower thoracic spine, the rhomboid disappears and the lats come in. And then in the lumbar spine, you'll see that the trapezius disappears, the serratus posterior inferior comes in underneath the lat, 
and the erector spinae becomes the multifidus muscle because uh, it, what the reason that's important is because the erector spinae muscle actually kind of fans out and connects to those iliac crests. And so that's a little bit uh, of importance in that when you're doing the lumbar blocks, you kind of need to tip that probe ever so slightly medial on the cranial side and ever so slightly lateral on the caudal side to be in plane with those muscle fibers and that'll really crisp up the, uh, the transverse process view. So how do we do this block? Well, it's pretty simple. On the ultrasound, you'll see the needle, take it. You'll hit the transverse process with the needle. You'll back off ever so slightly from that transverse process and you'll deposit the local anesthetic underneath or anterior to the anterior fascia of the erector spinae muscle and posterior or above on the ultrasound, the uh, transverse process. Then after we put the local in, we'll put a bolus in and thread that catheter right through that area. Sort of the million dollar question is how does, how does this block work? Well, when we place local anesthetic um, right against that TP and anterior to the erector spinae muscle, we get spread down the erector spinae plane. So that's gonna cover all of your dorsal uh, rami here. And then that local anesthetic actually tracks around the transverse process into that paravertebral space. And that'll cover your ventral rami. And then again, we think that that local anesthetic travels into the dorsal root ganglia and then a small portion probably even travels into the ipsilateral epidural space. So essentially you get an epidural block without all of the side effects, the large sympathectomy, hypotension, bradycardia, and fluid shifts that you can get with an epidural. Just quickly to show the anatomy, you can see the three layers here. You can see the transverse process. And all we do basically is take that needle, put it right on that transverse process, back off ever so slightly and inject the local anesthetic, thread that catheter off right into that plane. I'll pass it to Dr. Reddy now to explain a little bit of the, the bony and the, uh, the neural anatomy, and then we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth on that. So I think most of you guys from doing, um, you know, epidurals and, and other techniques from anesthesia are pretty familiar with the anatomy. The one point I really wanted to drive home on these slides is if you're looking at interacting with the transverse process with a needle, as long as you're lateral to the pars, there's really no way to get into trouble with this, right? Even if you end up deep, you'll end up in the psoas. If you end up too superficial, you'll end up in the, um, in the erector spinae muscles or in the, um, the paraspinal muscles. And if you end up, you know, bouncing off the transverse process, you're just bouncing off the bone. It's really going to be very difficult to create any sort of epidural problems as long as you're lateral to the pars. So when you're, you're finding your anatomy, finding your anatomy medial, and then walking your way lateral, as you're seeing sort of facet joint, which is a good landmark that you'll see, and then pars, and then transition to the TP, gives you a sense that you know you're gonna be safe in that plane. Um, here we have a 3D representation of, you know, lumbar spine, uh, sacrum, you know, we've been using these uh, quite often on our, you know, one and two and three level cases, we end up uh, placing these catheters mostly in the, in the high lumbar spine, uh, where you're, you're really going to be very safe um, uh, with your needle and with your anatomy. If, you, they ha if they've had previous fusions, we've had pretty good success trying to stay above those fusions um, and, and just starting wherever the rods and screws stop because um, the posterior lateral fusion mass will sometimes uh, make it a little hard to uh, see your transverse process and see that plane uh, over there, especially when there's scar tissue from previous dissection. I think this is back to you, Brian. Yep, here's a little bit, just a little bit more anatomy in the lumbar spine. Um, it, as you can see, it's pretty clear that you can find that uh, transverse process fairly easily uh, and then just bounce right off that transverse process and, and put that local anesthetic uh, right there underneath that erector spine A plane. I will like to point out, uh, there's a little bit of difference in the way that the transverse processes look in the thoracic spine versus the lumbar spine. And so I, I think most of us have done paravertebral blocks in the thoracic spine. You kind of know how to spread out from medial to lateral, see that, uh, see that paravertebral space. You'll find that transverse process is a fairly easy thing to do in the thoracic spine. In the lumbar spine, there's a little bit of trick to it. 
So every time that I do an erector spinae catheter, even though we've done thousands of them at this point, I start with the, the probe right on the spinous processes. You can always see spinous processes, slide lateral. In the lumbar spine, what's interesting is there's a very short lamina and then a very large facet. And a lot of people get a little bit tricked by that very large facet, thinking it's the transverse process, but it's not. You'll slide a little bit more lateral and you'll see that the transverse process kind of pops up lower and looks more paddled shaped, as you can see here, kind of a triangle on the end. So this is what we look for in our lumbar, lumbar transverse processes. And you can also see very nicely, you won't see all these three muscles kind of lining up nicely on the facet. You see it very, very nicely on top of that transverse process. So you've got lat, serratus inferior, uh, serratus uh, posterior inferior, and then you've got the erector spine and multifidus. And you've got really a nice, uh, nice area where you can hit that, uh, that transverse process and deposit the local anesthetic. So um, I'll let Dr. Reddy go ahead and talk about some of these uh, uses for us, thoracic and lumbar spine. So I'll pop through these and you can go ahead, Dr. Reddy. Sure. So, um, you know, obviously the vast majority of spinal cases that you'll see uh, are going to be one, two, and three level cases. I mean, obviously we do larger cases, but percentage wise in terms of the cases where we are going to have the best benefit out of these procedures, we're going to, we're going to see that more in the sort of uh, bread and butter spinal cases um, where we have a, a discernible area that we can identify that we're going to be able to cover. I think the bigger revisions and scoliosis cases, you, there's certainly case reports and literature, uh, sorry, literature uh, that supports using these for bigger cases. But I think it, it's really, really clear in our experience that they make a huge difference for our one, two, and three level cases. And those are the patients where we really can spare them a lot of opioid uses. I think when you do a big scoliosis case or a, do a big revision, that patient's going to be on opioids regardless of, of what regional techniques you use. But I think we've had good success in really severely limiting the amount of opioids people take uh, using these regional techniques. So certainly we're using these on uh, our uh, discectomies, our laminectomies, our um, posterior fusion. So whether you're doing an inner body or whether you're just doing a posterior lateral old school rods and screws, uh, we're having uh, good success covering lateral inner body fusions. Um, anti psoas laterals are really a variant of laterals where you cheat the incision a little further over towards the abdomen, almost think of it like a hybrid between an anterior lumbar inner body fusion and a lateral. And then certainly some of our fractures are probably the area where we find ourselves most often using them in the thoracic spine. These older patients who have ankylosing spondylitis and they fall down and they need a short segment instrumented fusion, uh, which is pretty common in, in spine centers where you're getting patients through the emergency room they have a, a great um, ability to cover that surgical area. And those are also the patients who really postoperatively get a lot of delirium from the opioids and we can really reduce their length of stay and reduce their postoperative complications with better regional techniques. Uh, I think we can go on to the next slide. So, you know, our lumbar discectomies, there are a lot of different ways to do a lumbar discectomy. You can do it through a midline open approach. You can do it through a tube-based minimally invasive approach with about a two centimeter incision. Either way, I think the important thing to know is just covering with your surgical team. You know, one thing we do well is Brian and I talk a lot about what we're doing and what our plan is and knowing what side we're doing, what level we're doing, where you're gonna place the catheter and, and sort of only covering the side of the microdiscectomy. It's relatively of poor utility to try to place a catheter on the contralateral side uh, for a microdiscectomy. Uh, next slide. So for a laminectomy, it changes a little bit. So knowing that the surgeon's doing bilateral work uh, especially an open laminectomy, you're more likely to want to place a catheter on both sides. And that's what we've had success with is being above the surgical site, placing catheters on both sides. You know, there are, there are ways to do a laminectomy through a minimally invasive incision where you have an incision on one side of the spine, much like a discectomy, but we do bony work underneath the tube on the contralateral side. And for those patients, even though the incision is unilateral, we will still place a catheter on both sides because you will get um, some of that uh, creep around the TP, almost like a medial branch block, you'll get some uh, coverage of the facet joint and we're undercutting the facet joint on the contralateral side when we do that uh, tube-based minimally invasive laminectomy. Uh, next slide. So lumbar posterior uh, fusions, this is, you know, again, bread and butter spine surgery where we're making an open incision, uh, putting in cages, putting in rods and screws, and we are, you know, dissecting out 
uh, the transverse processes and the, um, the area where you would actually place an erector spinae block at, at the level of our surgery. So you're gonna to wanna to stay above that and place those catheters in uh, more normal anatomy um, after surgery. Um, and we, you know, there's a lot of variations of that, minimally invasive, open, all of them you'll place bilateral catheters for. Um, next slide. So, you know, multi-level fusions, again, usually we're, we're using these more so for sort of three-level T-lifts uh, and below, but certainly there's not really a great limit to where I would tell you uh, that there's a, a discernible stopping point. I think it's, it's more of a patient-to-patient -patient, uh, conversation depending on their anatomy. And even if you get 50% uh, coverage in the top part of the incision, it certainly is, um, is, is helpful. If it's a shorter segment, where you're gonna have room to work below, you can actually place catheters above and below your surgical site if say it's a uh, T12 to L3 uh, type of fusion that we're doing usually for a fracture or trauma, but most of our lumbar fusions end at the sacrum or end in the pelvis and there's not a lot of room to work below there. So you're usually working above. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so laterals are uh, interesting because you're making an incision over the flank or over the uh, sort of anterior uh, abdomen. The patient is usually in a, a true lateral uh, position uh, with a bump under there uh, and really kind of hyperangulated to open up that space. But you can see from the animation on the right that we're really distracting open the facet joints. We're really changing the anatomy. And even though our incision is unilateral, you're gonna wanna try to place bilateral catheters for this. And certainly at the end of the case, after everything's been done, removing those bumps will neutralize the spine for positioning and make that anatomy much more symmetric and normal for you to place uh, ESP catheters. And as, as difficult or daunting as it seems like to, to place them in this position, it's actually, uh, you know, Brian can speak to this a little bit. It's, it's not that difficult, even in bigger patients, you know, the bigger side is the abdominal side and that's all fallen forward to the other side. And you're kind of working on a, a, a spine that doesn't have a, a lot of scar tissue or instrumentation in it yet. And you can certainly um, uh, work unfettered. And we, we do these routinely for, uh, for thoracic cases as well, and it, you know, uh, thoracotomies and thoracoscopies. And so this is a, a pretty easy transition to do these bilateral catheters while the patient is asleep in a lateral position. And you, you'll find the, the anatomy shows up pretty well because again, you're just going for a bony structure, so. All right, next slide. Uh, this is you know, a good example of is sort of a, a limited fracture case or a case where somebody has a burst fracture and we've placed you know, screws above, screws below. These typically happen at the thoracolumbar junction. And you can see, I'm not sure what levels those are on the left. I know it's my case, but um, I think that's uh, T12 at the top. L1 is the burst and L2 is the level below. Uh, so you know, placing uh, catheters above and below this uh, may be reasonable, but I, I honestly think if you went above this, you would get good enough coverage to get these, these three levels just fine. Um, uh, and, and we've had great success doing that. Uh, and again, that's that vulnerable patient population that I think really does benefit from uh, opioid sparing and early mobilization. All right, we, next slide. We find, oh, three, we find three to four levels of clinical coverage each way. The, uh, the cadaveric data says it could be as many as seven or eight each way, you know, the, the whole spine, the, the, the uh, dye kind of travels up and down. But clinically, we find about three to four levels each way of where that catheter is placed. So certainly placing one catheter above or something like this is, is easy enough. And that's what we tend to do. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, there certainly is literature to support this. Brian and I didn't come up with this on our own. I mean, people have been doing this across the world. Um, they're all small studies that we found, but, you know, there's a randomized controlled trial. I think that first one was out of India where they randomized patients uh, for lumbar spinal surgery in two small groups, and they saw decreased uh, morphine usage postoperatively. They saw decreased pain scores on the VAS pain scores and uh, better patient satisfaction, all with uh, statistically significant differences between the two cohorts. Um, there was a, a nice case series that was published of uh, lumbar uh, discectomies uh, for patients uh, uh, undergoing elective spine surgery that had again uh, shown uh, it to be a, a safe and effective method for controlling pain and reducing opioids uh, in a small cohort. Um, thoracic level uh, or low thoracic for the junction uh, they've been doing in France as well. That's uh, where that case series is from. Uh, 
Um, this one was from Korea, I want to say, and Spine Journal. Uh, and this was, a, again, small. It was a, a case report of a really, uh, a, a really interesting use uh, where the patient had a previous T3 to the pelvis uh, fusion, uh, and uh, they were still able to get uh, reasonable ESP blocks um, at, uh, at T4. Uh, and then the last uh, paper was a, a, a bigger study. I think there were uh, 40-some patients involved um, that really kind of gave credence to say, hey, this is uh, safe, it's effective, and uh, for 24 hours after surgery, uh, they saw de decreasing amounts of opioids uh, with uh, higher satisfaction scores and lower VAS pain scores. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's certainly enough literature to suggest that doing this is safe and effective and I think if anybody is uh, gun shy about uh, what they're gonna see clinically, I, I think it, it proves itself to you. I mean, I think when you do it, uh, it's, it's not hard to win over your spine surgeons. They will see a difference uh, doing this uh, on their patients. And I think all spine surgeons wanna give people less narcotics and get people out of the hospital faster. So it's, it's really a win-win situation for both the anesthesia and the surgical teams. Just quickly address the, the concerns about anticoagulation. I know some sometimes people ask about using uh, retrospinate plane catheters in patients who are anticoagulated. You know, this is some of these patients who are older, sicker, and maybe on these medications for cardiac issues or, or, um, or even PEs. Uh, so ASRA doesn't make a recommendation currently, but it's based on the likelihood of vascular violation, which in, in an ESP is almost zero. Really the only vasculature there would be the, the periosteum, and that really doesn't have much blood uh, that, that would come out if you were to nick a, a vessel there. Compressibility, you're between a very strong muscle and a bone, so likely to compress any, uh, <clears throat> any vasculature that would, would open up there, and so you, you're not likely to get a hematoma. And then the consequences of a hematoma between that muscle and bone, really nothing, and the likelihood that that would travel all the way around into the epidural space and cause a significant epidural hematoma is almost zero. Uh, we've used these on open hearts, we've used these on patients on Plavix, Eliquis, all of the anticoagulants. And I think probably most strikingly in the literature, at least as of a week ago, I, I'll be honest, I haven't looked at the literature in about a week, there were no reported epidural hematomas after, uh, after erector spinae plane catheters. And again, unless you're medial to the pars with your needle, I cannot conceive of a way that you could create an epidural hematoma with this technique. I mean, it's really safe and effective. You could sit there and bounce the needle off the TP, you know, hundreds of times and you wouldn't be able to create an epidural hematoma. We break the TPs in spine surgery, you know, purposefully to get fusion sometimes and we don't create epidural hematomas doing that. So uh, I, I think it really makes sense that it's, it's very safe from that perspective. So we'll transition a little bit now from ESPs for thoracic and lumbar posterior spine and talk a little bit about superficial cervical plexus catheters for the ACDFs, the anterior cervical discectomies and fusions. Um, I think Dr. Reddy will take uh, just a little bit of discussion on where we're using these. Sure. So, you know, typically, again, the vast majority of our ACDFs are three levels or less. Um, cervical disc replacements are usually one and two level procedures. Uh, we're finding uh, pretty good results with three levels or less with this. And I'm finding as a, as a surgeon, you know, I think this covers really nicely postoperatively the incisional pain that patients get. Uh, and I don't have to use a lot of local during the surgery. One of the problems with using local during ACDFs is after you put it in, if you put it in at the start of the case, it kind of leaks all over the place and you're constantly kind of mopping up the local, trying to keep it from weeping into your wound. And if you put it in at the end of the case, you know, you're, you're working a lot of times right around the external jugular vein. And it's very easy once it's all closed up and you've put all your sutures in, if you're putting in your local then, it's easy to potentially perforate the external jugular vein and get a big you know, goose egg of a hematoma in the anterior neck which is always scary. So, you know, this has been covering really nicely doing unilateral superficial cervical plexus catheters uh, on the side uh, or single shot blocks on the side that we're operating um, uh, for our patients and, and then pulling them out before they leave the hospital the next day, or uh, if they're going home, sort of engineering it as a single shot. Uh, this is, uh, you know, our typical approach for an ACDF. So uh, usually you want to know which side your surgeon's working on. Most surgeons will always work on the same side, but there are certain um, uh, situations that will cause us to, to, to change that. So certainly, again, working closely with your surgeon to have a plan ahead of time to know, hey, it's a right-sided approach. He's a right-handed surge, surgeon. Um, we're going to place these catheters on the right side. 
or knowing, hey, if it's a revision, you know, please let us know that you're going to go from the left and we're going to put the catheter on the left um, and, and communicating that ahead of time. Um, we are typically working in this plane uh, medial to the sternocleidomastoid and lateral to the medial structures. Again, uh, the carotid artery falls laterally with the, with the carotid sheath and the vascular bundle, and the esophagus falls medially or to the contralateral side, and we're able to bluntly dissect right down onto the uh, spine and, and the, separate the longus coli and really get access to the disc space there. And as long as you keep that catheter in the superficial cervical plexus and not all the way to the deep cervical plexus, we're way out of the way with the catheter, so it, it, you can place it preoperatively. Uh, and the other, the other thing, so just to point out, we don't do bilateral superficial cervical plexus blocks, uh, mostly because we're a little bit uh, nervous about getting local anesthetic all the way down to the deep cervical plexus bilaterally and, and all the consequences that would come with that. So. And you really wouldn't have no need to do a bilateral superficial block for this. It's a very unilateral approach. We rarely cross the midline with our incision. It's, it's, it is decidedly one side because we have to pick to get around the esophagus and the trachea. Just a little bit more anatomy. This is what you'll see on the ultrasound. Um, Dr. Reddy gave us a nice picture. Uh, mine, mine wasn't quite as nice, so he, he supplied this one. Um, you know, we used to do these blindly and our success was so-so, not great. Now that we're able to, to use an ultrasound, see exactly where we're going, we, we can see the hood of the, uh, <clears throat> of the scalene muscles. We can actually, most of the time, see uh, the uh, interscalene, interscalene view there. We'll slide a little bit posterior. You'll see that sternocleidomastoid muscle kind of come down, and they, they call it a baleen whale. In fact, uh, the PA that works with Dr. Reddy always makes fun of us for calling it the baleen whale. But when we talk about it, we talk about that baleen whale where the the nose and mouth kind of come together, you get kind of a point. So right underneath that point and right above that hood of the sternocleidum or of the, uh, of the scaling muscles, you put that, that needle right in there, inject the local, thread the catheter in, and you'll be sitting right at the uh, superficial cervical plexus. And it, you can actually see it a little bit on here. We're now, you know, we have bigger patients. We don't always see the actual nerves themselves, but we know what plane we're going into. But on, on this particular picture, it's a nice picture you can see uh, at least three portions of that superficial cervical plexus. And here's a catheter threading in. Uh, so you can see the local anesthetic. You can see that catheter coming in. We try not to overthread that catheter. If you overthread it, you end up down by the carotid and you'll get a fair amount of, of uh, deep cervical plexus. Not that that's always a big deal if it's unilateral, but we try to stay away from that a little bit if possible. So we, we'll get that needle in and we'll get that catheter just off the end of that needle uh, and then kind of leave it right there so we continue to get the superficial cervical plexus primarily. And we'll usually counsel these patients before surgery to, of what to expect after surgery. A lot of them will have, you know, a little bit of creep up into the jaw or that sort of lower facial area. We'll say, hey, it's supposed to be numb. It's engineered to be numb. Don't worry about it. It'll you know, fade away with time. Um, but uh, if, you, if you don't and you don't have that conversation with them, sometimes they're, they're a little thrown off by it. Uh, so again, then we'll transition one more time to our use of tap catheters. Um, and so we'll talk just a little bit about uh, the use of the tap catheters in our spinal surgeries. So um, anterior lumbar surgery, you know, there's really two main uh, reasons to go anterior or two main procedures we're doing are anterior lumbar interbody fusions and uh, lumbar disc replacements. Um, OLIF is a variant on the anterior lumbar interbody fusion where you're a little more uh, lateral and you're a little more oblique so you can kind of sneak around in bigger patients the belly kind of falls away and you can kind of use that plane um, but uh, these are typically things uh, that are done in an open fashion you know without sort of minimally invasive techniques and that anterior area can really limit patients ability to move after surgery and I think I would tell you that these catheters were probably my gateway drug for spine surgery renal, regional anesthetic I think when I started working with Brian these were really the cases where we noticed a huge difference in how our patients did with a good tap block and how much less opioids they took. And for an anterior surgery, it's really important because for an anterior surgery, we're worried about bowel recovery. It's much more like general surgery where we're really worried about how many opi opioids they take because it'll slow down their recovery, their ability to eat after surgery. And really we want them to get to a normal diet before we discharge them from the hospital. And if we're giving them opioids and that's slowing them down, 
it, it could really delay their length of stay. So we really probably shaved a whole day off our length of stay by using regional techniques versus our traditional, you know, sort of PCA based opioids um, post-operatively. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. So anterior lumbar interbody fusions, there's a couple different variants of how to do this, but most of the time we're staying retroperitoneal uh, and we are, we are coming down in the, in the midline, splitting the rectus and then sliding the whole peritoneal contents up and out of the way and working our way around the left side. We'll get our hand down onto the psoas and then kind of gently dissect the vessels off the anterior lumbar spine. You know, for L5 and S1, we'll be working between the vessels, but at L4-5, we're ligating the iliolumbar vein and really rolling the whole sac of the iliac artery and iliac vein um, out, uh, after they've bifurcated back towards the other side so we can work uh, without any neural elements in our way and really maximize our footprint in terms of our hardware that we put in. It's a very powerful correction tool for getting height and angle back in patients who lack it, as you see on the right. Next slide. I think this is Brian. Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so when we talk about tap blocks uh, and tap catheters, I think most of you know that this is a primarily somatic block. You don't get a lot of uh, a visceral um, component or, or visceral analgesia with this. So uh, as I said, primarily sensory nerves, we can cover much of the anterior and lateral chest, uh, kind of up to about T6 or so, anterior and lateral trunk. You maybe get portions of the posterior trunk if you kind of drop in and do a little bit of a QL1. Um, and then with, with some of these other blocks, um, like erector spinae blocks, you can get the breast and the uh, anterior meter up, upper leg with the erector spinae. So what I'd say is what happened for us is we started with the, the tap catheters. And uh, we still do those from time to time. Um, but I think really what, what this did is it showed us that the regional anesthesia would work for spine. And so we sort of moved most of our, even our A-lifts to ESP catheters. And then we add either kind of depending on, on how big the procedure is, either single shot taps to that just to cover that first four or five hours of that anterior incisional pain or tap catheters if we really think that they're going to have a lot of, you know, chronic opioid users or, or patients who are having bigger A-lifts, we'll put the tap catheters in as well. So, um, you know, it's a nice uh, additive tool for us. We, we rarely do these by themselves anymore, um, but an additive tool at this point. And it works really well. I mean, we had a chronic pain patient the other day that we brought in and she came in on Percocet and we did a uh, preoperative ESP catheter bilateral in the back before we did the A-lift. And then I, <laughs> excuse me, I did the A-lift and uh, post-operatively, we did a single shot tap and she went up to the floor afterwards and the tap covered the incisional pain from surgery. And then the ESP started to creep around and not only did the ESP get the splay of the facets and that posterior deep pain that they get, it also started to cover where the tap block single shot started to wear off. The continuous uh, feature of the on cue kicked in and really started giving her uh, that anterior coverage as well. And, and she needed very minimal opioids for what we typically see for our patients who are, who already come in on opiates. I mean, she did fantastically uh, in the hospital and I think she was discharged 24 hours after her ALF. I mean, she really did very well. Yeah. And like, like, uh, like Deepak said, we, we do add that tap block a lot of times when we do the ESPs for the anteriors, just because it takes those ESPs anywhere from about four to eight hours to really kick in and cover that. And so we, we noticed that after we did five or six of them that the patients were really complaining of that mm -hmm. anterior pain. But then at about four to eight hours, they said, oh, I'm, I'm great now. So we just add that tap in there and it, and it tends to help quite a bit. I, I think most of you guys have done taps. And so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but you, you place the local anesthetic and the catheter between the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis muscle. I think most of them, most of us have done those. If you haven't, we can talk a little bit more about them and ask some questions at the end. But essentially, you open up that potential space. You cover all of the anterior portion of the thoracic um, and maybe even lumbar one, depending on how, how low you go down, um, the, the portions of those nerves there. Uh, just a little bit more, uh, more anatomy, talking a little bit about um, subcostal tap blocks. We don't do this really much for spine, but just for completeness sake, subcostal tap blocks, they're kind of up, up higher, right underneath the ribs, right in between the, the rectus abdominis and the transverse abdominis. Uh, 
Talk quickly about the catheters that we use. We really like the over the needle catheter. Very, very versatile, four inch and six inch, and very, very easy to place. It's just like placing an angio cath for an IV. You just, you put the, the block and the needle in the right spot, slide that catheter right off and it's right in the right spot. You don't have to thread a needle or a catheter through a needle. You don't have to worry about having extra hands or well, did the catheter go somewhere it shouldn't? This catheter stays right where you put it. And it doesn't leak because the catheter is bigger than the needle in this case. So once you get that catheter in the right spot, there's no leaking from it. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a thoracic case, uh, thoracic that we, a thoracic spine case that we had done. Um, you know, these are six inch catheters. We're probably up about, oh, I don't know, T5, give or take. Um, which uh, I can't remember this procedure is one of the first ones we did, but just to show you kind of what it looks like, you've got those, uh, got the two catheters in there bilaterally, preoperatively. Um, you know, the hub is right here, uh, right underneath this securement device. And so we just kind of take those, um, uh, the tubing out the side and then hook the ball up on the front. Um, and, and I'll let uh, Deepak start with this, and then I'll, I'll kind of add in at the end, but we'll just talk a little bit about how we built an effective regional anesthesia team for spine procedures. So I think one of the biggest battles is getting surgeons to sort of understand that regional is an option. I still think the vast majority of spine surgeons don't really know that there are good regional techniques that can help with decreasing their patient's opioid burden after surgery. So some of it's surgeon education, and some of it is if you can just get one surgeon in the institution to start doing it, the word will spread. So what we started doing is we started doing it and the PACU nurses started noticing that our patients were having less pain postoperatively. And the floor nurses started saying that as well. And they started mentioning it to other doctors who were rounding saying, why aren't you doing what Dr. Reddy is doing? And then they started asking the anesthesia team, what's Dr. Reddy doing differently than I'm doing? And then they started testing it. And I think, you know, there's always going to be um, a gateway drug. And I think, you know, the ESP is so versatile that you can pick smaller cases to sort of prove its, prove the concept to them. And I think once they start seeing it in their uh, routine bread and butter cases, I think they'll really start trying to find out, you know, where can I not use this? I mean, we, it's, it's more so now that we're trying to figure out uh, what cases do we not use it on versus what cases do we use it on? Um, and then after that, obviously, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's training the staff, it's training uh, the floor nurses, it's training people to sort of push opioids less on the floor to assess pain uh, before uh, asking for opioids, because it's a pretty foreign concept to have a lumbar fusion patient and not be giving them a PCA or not be putting them on opioids. So sort of retraining your staff and having that conversation with the nurses upstairs to make sure that even though we've given them tools to take less opioids, to make sure that they actually get less opioids uh, going forward. And from my point of view, training and education of our anesthesia staff, uh, basically everybody that we work with knows how to do these blocks knows how to do them effectively, and knows how to place an ESP catheter. Uh, same, with, same with tap catheters, which is, which is something that we've done for quite a while. And then the superficial cervical plexus catheters as well. So training, education, showing proficiency, not letting um, staff kind of get involved in this, anesthesia staff get involved in this until they've been trained and educated and show proficiency. And then what we've done everywhere we are is standardize it. Okay, every patient who has this procedure, it's this regional technique. So that's helped quite a bit. So there's no question between surgeons, between anesthesia providers, you know, what's this patient getting? Oh, will they get this? Will they get that? Everything's standardized so we know exactly what they're getting. Uh, down to the exact same amount and concentration of local anesthetic with the same adjuncts, the same rate that we start the catheters at and everything everything from start to finish. And then as Deepak and I have talked about today, communication. You know, We talk to each other all the time when we're in the operating room, before we're in the operating room, trying to figure out what's the best regional anesthetic technique for this procedure. Is there anything different about this procedure? You go on left instead of right for your ACDF and that sort of stuff. So communication obviously key as well. I think the other thing is as spine surgeons, there are a lot of patients uh, who are right on the border of what we think we can reasonably get done and send them home as an outpatient. And as you look at the numbers from sort of 2005 forward, outpatient spine is gaining a lot of steam in terms of trying to do A-lifts as an outpatient or MIST lifts as an outpatient. And I think we all are a little nervous as spine surgeons to be confident that we can get those patients out in terms of 
you know, bed geography and admissions and, and, and trying to get people out efficiently. And I think all of those patients that surgeons are on the fence about, you know, could they go, should they stay? These techniques really help tip the scales towards saying, hey, we can get their pain under control and we can get them to go home within 24 hours. And for a lot of facilities, that's very attractive to sort of transition those patients to, to an outpatient stay. Just quickly talk about why on cue and Avanos are kind of the, the gold standard, the best that's out there. Um, you know, on cue gives you the ability to provide pain relief for multiple days. We leave these catheters in for three, four, five days, sometimes longer, but I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, we, get, we get reduced complications. We give, we give the patients the ability to adjust the catheters, which they love, right? The patients can turn the catheter up, the, the rate on the catheter up, the rate on the catheter down, on, off. They're more satisfied because they feel like they're controlling their own pain. And then again, improve cost effectiveness from decreasing length of stay, decreasing opioids, decreasing the need for a PCA, which is, which is actually pretty expensive when you look at the pharmacy charge on a PCA. And, and then on cue and Avanos itself has a few sort of nice add-ons that you get by using their product. So they'll, they'll help you set up a program. They'll come in and help you set up an entire regional anesthesia program or if you want to say, hey, I just want to do spine regional anesthesia program, they'll help you set that up. They give you some ongoing training events like this and cadaver labs and some other stuff that Deepak and I do. And then what's really, really nice is they have a, a 24 hour hotline that the patients get the number for and can call. If they have any kind of simple problems, a nurse answers that line, tells them, you know, hey, yes, do this or that or don't do this or that. Um, and then obviously they'll kick it up to to either send the patient to the ER or or to contact the physician if they don't know the answer to the question. But that saves a lot of, of unnecessary phone calls to the physician who places the catheter. And with that, uh, we'll take any questions. Perfect, thank you both. That was a great presentation and a lot of helpful information. So we have a couple questions coming in here, so we'll take the last 15 minutes um, to go through those. But so the first one coming up, um, are these blocks being done post or pre-op and does this vary upon case type? Yeah, it's, it's dependent on case type. Um, so the superficial cervical plexus catheters will typically place preoperatively. Uh, tap catheters, obviously we're doing those. We typically do those at the end because we don't want to be in the field. The erector spinae plane catheters are, are kind of a, a crapshoot, kind of depending on, on what's happening in the surgery and how big it's going to be. One or two level, we can easily place those preoperatively, typically above, very easy to do. You get much bigger than one or two level, we're typically having to go postoperatively unless we're way, way far away. Um, and so, you know, it kind of depends. But um, if I have my druthers, I would always rather do them preoperatively. Obviously, the patients typically are asleep. Our A lifts, we do the, the ESP catheters in, in pre op. So that's a whole nother story. But if, if I can get these blocks and catheters done preoperatively, uh, that, that gives me the ability to do some preemptive analgesia, less opioids during the procedure, but postoperatively still works well. I was pretty gun shy originally about them being placed preoperatively uh, because the spine surgeons were always worried. You know, we pull so hard on the spine and we've got all these crazy retractors that we're putting in. We're worried we're going to displace the catheter. And honestly, we really haven't had it happen. Um, it, it's, it's really not been an issue. Um, I also was a little gun shy about, oh, am I going to see some of the fluid from the catheter when I'm doing my posterior based lumbar procedures? Is it going to track down the TPs? And we're really aggressive in exposing the TPs in the area that we're working. And I've yet to see a rush of fluid from the tap catheters, right? It just, it never really, I'm sorry, from the ESP catheters above. It, it really just, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised at how well it works placing them beforehand. So I agree, if you can place them beforehand, it does make sense to do so. Um, and, uh, and I think it gives it longer to sort of get that effect. We see with the ESPs, they kind of start posterior and then they kind of creep their way around. And especially for like a 360 fusion, the earlier you can get it in, the more likely you are to get coverage or the earlier you are to get coverage. I'm sorry if that answer was off point. Uh, my headphones cut out and I didn't hear the question. I just heard Brian talking. So I just piled on. You, you got it. You got it. It was right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, <laughs> you got it. Um, so the next question that we have is uh, what flow rate are you typically using for each of these blocks? So if we do bilateral, oh, well, uh, let's start with ESP because that's kind of the focus of the talk. Um, so if we do bilateral ESPs, 
we'll typically start with a, a dual lumen um, dial of flow. And so the highest that goes is seven per side. If we think it's gonna be a big painful procedure, chronic opioid user, we can hook up two balls. So we'll do that and have the somewhere between 10 and 12 mLs per hour per side, depending on how big the patient is. Um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the superficial cervical plexus, we start at four. It's such a small space that we don't really need need much uh, local anesthetic there. Uh, for the tap catheters, um, if there's only two of them in there, again, we start at that seven. But I have a very low threshold to go to using two separate on cue balls and and running them at 10 or 12 mLs per hour per side, depending on the weight of the patient there as well. These big fascial planes, they need a lot of volume. Perfect. Thank you. So the next one, this comes from a neurosurgeon concentrating on spine. So he does single T lift from one side, placing the cage across the midline and using red screws almost exclusively on one side. Is it possible to use the block on one side only for this case? You know, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, you could, theoretically, it'll cover your incision pretty well. But the problem is when you're putting in that cage and somebody who's pretty collapsed, you're going to get a little bit of facet mediated pain from splaying. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we're T-lifting those patients, they start out at, you know, five millimeters disc height and you put in a, a 10 or a 12 millimeter cage and you're really going to open up that space. So, you know, I would suggest that if you're going to do it to put in bilateral catheters for that, I think you'll be happier with the results. Um, and the last thing you want to do is put in a single catheter and, and not get the result you want after they've already got the ultrasound there, they're already working to put in the catheters. It's a negligible amount of time to put in the second catheter. Sounds good. That was helpful. Thank you. So this one's coming, um, talking a little bit more about coding, but um, for ESP catheters, how are you coding for them given there is no code? Yeah, so this goes back and forth, and, and I used to have a slide on it, and then I was, um, it was suggested to not have a full slide on it, but uh, so it's been going back and forth. We initially were building the 64999 code, uh, which nobody was, very few payers were paying, and so we switched to the 64463, which is the paravertebral code. Uh, payers started paying that pretty well. Um, and then our billing company went back and said, well, we should probably go back to doing the 64999 because there were some changes in the wording uh, in January, January of 2021. Um, and what we're finding now is even though we're billing the 64999, uh, and then there's a modifier code for the catheter, uh, most of the payers are actually paying quite well for it and paying some of them paying even better than the pair vertebrals. So when we send this into our billing company and the billing company sends it to the payers, we bill it as a paravertebral catheter done via the erector spinae approach and then bill at that 64999. And that, that tends to be what, what uh, pays pretty well. Um, so at this point, we're at the 64999. That could change six months from now. It's gone back and forth three times since we started using, uh, using these catheters. And so that, that's what I'd say for now, 64999. Sounds good. Thank you. So one, uh, one question that came through, it focuses on lumbar placement, specifically L2 and below. Um, can you dive into more details on how you can differentiate between facet and TP, especially around L4 and L5? Um, we have seen that when scanning from the spinous process out, you can get confused between facet and transverse process. Mm -hmm. So I would say the, the easiest thing you can do is slide as far lateral as you can get and not see bone anymore. When you slide off the TP, all you see is psoas underneath it, and then slide back a little bit medial, and you'll see that, that transverse process. There's also a distinct um, anatomic and shape difference between the facet and the transverse process. The facet is more of a rounded type shape. The transverse process in the lumbar spine, especially two, three, four, and five, is again, that what we showed you earlier, and maybe I can go back to it. Um, see if I can click back that direction but uh, anyway so the, the the shape is much more of sort of a steeple or triangle shape on the transverse process itself and then almost sort of a column underneath it uh, of hypo hypoechoic uh, area so it's um, it's a pretty distinct difference but I think the easiest thing to do when you start is to start midline slide lateral you'll see big facet 
and then you'll see the transverse process drops lower on the ultrasound, so deeper, and then changes that shape. Slide off the end, find that you're only looking at psoas muscle, and then slide back a little medial, and then you'll, you'll see the tip of the transverse process. And that's, that's where you'll be sure it's the transverse process. Perfect. Thanks for the clarification. Um, one more came in just to follow up to the coding. So kind of going back to that, but um, do you know if you're receiving a facility fee or uh, only physician fee yeah, for both. the ESP? Okay. Both. Yeah. We're, we're receiving the facility fee and the physician fee and the, the professional fee uh, and the ultrasound code isn't bundled either in the ESP right now. So we're getting a, an ultrasound code fee for those as well. It'll come eventually, paravertebrals, they bundled the, the, um, the ultrasound code, but it hasn't yet, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple more questions coming in. We've got, got more. Um, so the next one is, can you go into more detail on cases where there is a dura tear? Sure, so <laughs> again, um, you know, in our experience, we don't, when we place them preoperatively, we don't see the fluid from the catheter, right? So I think your, your concern of, you know, if there's a dural tear, what do you do? Does this change it? it? It really doesn't. And I mean, when you think about, you know, a lot of times when there's a dural tear, you'll still use local, right? I mean, you'll still put local in, in the muscle and in the skin above it. So I, I, I haven't changed my practice at all if we have a dural tear or even if we are, intentionally making a, a large durotomy for a, you know, an intrathecal mass that we're biopsying or removing, and then we're going to sew it up. Um, we don't typically change our plan. We'll still use an ESP uh, as long as the surgery sort of fits in terms of the size of the surgery um, to be covered by an ESP. So I, I, I wouldn't change what you do uh, based on the, the dural tear. I would just say Dr. Reddy doesn't get dural tears, so... Hmm. Great, thank you. So this next one, just what are some of the tips and tricks you have learned um, that you could pass on to someone starting on cue in spine surgery? Are there certain blocks you'd start with, um, you know, and any, any tips you can pass along? Yeah, from an anesthesia point of view, TAPS and ESPs are, would be the place to start. The superficial cervical plexus, I think people get a little bit more nervous being in the neck, um, but I would say TAPS and ESPs, easy place to start. And, and ESPs are great because they're so effective. So if you throw ESP catheters in, you're going to be happy. The patient's going to be happy and the surgeon's going to be happy. So from an anesthesia point of view, ESP is maybe place one to start. And if you maybe don't know how to do ESP catheters or aren't comfortable with them yet, you could certainly start with TAP catheters, get your, your pretty good results there, and then move on to the ESP. What, what would you say? A, from a spine surgery perspective, I think it's uh, number one, managing patient expectations. So, you know, as, as we found, you know, the biggest factor in trying to get a patient out of the hospital is an outpatient surgery is telling them from day one, when you meet them in the office and you tell them about their surgery, tell them they're going to have an outpatient surgery and they're going to be able to go home. I think along with that conversation says, hey, we're going to use uh, advanced regional techniques to help control your pain. So you take less opioids. So we're going to give you smaller prescriptions um, and, and lower medications and, and sort of managing those expectations. Otherwise you get patients who, you know, uh, say, Hey, my brother had this surgery and he went home with Percocet. Why am I going home with Ultram or Norco five? And, and you sort of, you have to fight that battle to reset their brain. So I'd say you know, setting those patient expectations ahead of time um, and start out small, right? I mean, I wouldn't say don't use it on the chronic pain patient who's getting a three-level fusion as your first case necessarily, right? Start with all these, you know, chip shot uh, discectomies, uh, single-level laminectomies, these cases that we do, you know, four or five of in a day where, you know what, and from an anesthesia perspective for a new provider who's doing this, you can get four or five. I mean, the best way to learn this is to repeat it over and over. And if you can do it four or five times in a day, I, I guarantee you'll feel more comfortable at the end of the day. And then that spine surgeon has their own little case control trial running of five discectomies that they did that day that they can track. You know, how did those patients do? How many times did they call the office? How comfortable were they? And sort of seeing them back in the office, talking to them about their experience. Just to, just to quickly address that question about the, the transverse process in the low lumbar. Um, you can see the picture right here. The, the shape is distinctly different of that, uh, of that transverse process than the facet. So, sorry, go ahead, Sam. 
Oh, no problem. No, I figured we can get through maybe two more questions here and then wrap it up. But um, the first one being, do you have a BMI limit for these techniques? <laughs> uh, well, I think the longest needle we have is 10 inches. So that would be it. Uh, Deeps, do you remember we did a we did a patient over at the main hospital. How big was that lady? I mean, she had to be 170 kilos, right? She was big. I mean, I usually have a BMI limit for spine surgery and I try to keep it, you know, in that under that 35 to 40 range if I can, but obviously I take call, right? And we get people with cauda equina who have a BMI of 50 and we have people who come in with fractures and people who come in with epidural abscesses and other infections. And so, you know, certainly uh, we, we try to stay under 40 if we can, but I think it matters a lot with a BMI that's high, it matters where they carry their weight. So, you know, there are all these people who are shaped differently. And a lot of these adult males have this huge beer belly and their BMI is astronomically high, but, you know, you can palpate their spinous processes. You know, they actually have relatively uh, reasonable anatomy in the back. So I think it's more important to maybe, you know, you can cheat as an anesthesiologist and look at the MRI. None of us are doing spine surgeries on people without an MRI. So you can really, you can measure very accurately how far it's going to be from the skin to the TP, just like we measure how long the tube we're going to drop when we're doing spine surgery and at least get an idea of, are you going to be, you know, 10 centimeters? Or are you going to be less than 10 centimeters? And, and, you know, obviously for your first cases, when you're starting out with this, you know, pick the smaller patients. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't say we have a hard cutoff. It, it depends much more on the patient's individual shape rather than a hard cutoff for BMI. We, rut we routinely do 120, 130 kilo patients. And it's, it's not, that's not out of the norm. Uh, you do want to use a curvilinear probe. And I, I probably was remiss not to mention that. You get into the lumbar spine on any patient who's over about 60 kilos, just switch to a curvilinear probe. And you, you see all of our, all of our pictures um, on, the, uh, on the presentation are with curvilinears in the lumbar spine. So that, that's, a, that's a big, big, big point there that, that you should, should probably take home. And keep in mind, BMI in the lumbar spine is magnified at L4-5 and L5-S1, and it's rare that you're placing the catheters on the TP of L4-5 and L5-S1. You're more often working in the higher aspects of the lumbar spine. You know, at L2, even in a big patient, L2 is much more accessible to get to the TP than it is to get to L4 or L5, where the lordosis is maximized and the depth is also maximized from the skin. L2 ends up coasting much more superficial as you kind of come out of that zone where you're transitioning from the lordosis of the lumbar spine to that neutral thoracolumbar junction. And maybe even as, as you get higher into the thoracic spine into that gentle kyphosis, you know, those cost over tubal joints and the TPs at that level become very superficial. Perfect. That was very helpful. So we're, we're a couple minutes over here. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up just to be cognizant of everyone's time. But um, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Schmutzler, thank you so much for your time, for your wonderful presentation today. And, you know, I want to say thank you to all the attendees for joining us for this event. So I'll leave it up. Uh, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Schmutzler, any closing, closing remark to wrap up? We're pretty accessible. I, I know everybody within Avenos has my, my cell phone number and my email. So feel free if you, if you have any questions afterwards, get a hold of your rep and have them get a hold of me and, and we can answer some questions that way. And then, you know, just, just try it. Try it a few times, see what you think. I think you'll be happy with the results. Same. Any, on the spine surgery side, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to speak to our experience and, and help uh, with any, any aspects of planning that I can help with. I think you know all of us uh, realize the profound impact the opi opioid epi epidemic has had on our communities, uh, and and I don't think you're going to find a doctor or an administrator in any town in America who doesn't support an initiative to reduce the amount of opioids in your community. So if people uh, talk to you about barriers to getting this done, I think you know the thing that champions this is that everybody wants to reduce opioids. Everybody wants to keep patients uh, safer and get them moving faster and have faster recovery after surgery. And I think this is a, a great pathway to doing so. And in spine surgery, it's really one of the only pathways we have other than, than what we've been doing for the last 40 years, right? Which is exactly the same thing where we're chasing pain with oral opioids. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your time tonight and have a great evening. Thanks On. everyone.
Thank you. On behalf of Avenos Acute Pain, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help Avenos plan future web events. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.